Welcome back, everyone. We're again here broadcasting from my apartment, continuing this coverage Monday through Friday, five days a week. And right now, we're heavily focused on this new coronavirus, this CCP virus. Today, we're going to go over this new individual hired by Twitter. She's going to be the architect of their new censorship system. And we're also going to be speaking today with Alex Newman. He's an award-winning reporter. He's going to be telling us about some of his investigations into the United Nations and specifically how the Chinese regime has gained control. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, this show is being censored to an extent by YouTube. I mentioned before we got alerts from YouTube stating that some of our content is promoting hateful content. And so if you disagree with them, uh, of course, we appreciate your support. Like and subscribe if you can. Also, when going to this channel, type in Crossroads with Joshua Phillip or just Crossroads in the search bar on YouTube to find this channel. Uh, also, we're, we have pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also subscribe there. So we're going to start off with some coverage today on China. In China's Jilin province, the Public Security Bureau and the Education Bureau are now closed due to CCP virus infections. And this is according to government workers who spoke with the Epoch Times. And this is notably happening as the Chinese regime has begun a partial shutdown, a partial lockdown of Jilin province. And again, this ties into the broader picture of this possible second wave that the Chinese regime itself is even now warning about coming to China. There are also reports from China saying that many of these factories that are manufacturing face masks have since closed down. Now, the Epoch Times is, rep is reporting that because of the initial demand, a lot of these factories sprung up, I mean hundreds of them, almost overnight, and they've been going out of business now almost just as quickly. There have been some reports from the ground there saying that some of the masks there are basically no better than paper. And part of the problem they had was apparently, according to what sources there are saying, is that because they sprung up so quickly, it, ca it caused a rise in the prices of the manufacturing equipment. A lot of the factories that were manufacturing these didn't have the equipment to actually make them. They saw it as a boom industry at a time when factories were being shut down. So a lot of people jumped in on it. They did not have the materials for it. They did not have the uh, you know, manufacturing machines for it. And so a lot of them were apparently even making these things by hand. The world saw the consequences of that. And of course, many countries bought these low quality masks, low quality materials, found they were not usable and have to deal with the situation now. Now, Radio Free Asia is reporting that Twitter cracks down on fake epidemic information and hires Chinese AI expert Li Feifei as sole director. Now, RFA reports that Twitter is looking to fight false information about the virus, much like we've seen apparently with Facebook and with YouTube. And they're looking for content that they can deem misleading and controversial and will be marking this content with warnings. Now, Twitter has appointed Li Feifei. She's a controversial Chinese expert on artificial intelligence who founded Google's AI China Center after joining Google in 2017. Whether she could assist Twitter in cracking down on fake information and maintaining the independence of independent directors has aroused public attention. Now, in Canada, the Globe and Mail is reporting China ramping up bullying and intimidation of activists in Canada, report says. Chinese government officials and supporters of the Communist Party of China are increasingly resorting to threats, bullying, and harassment to intimidate and silence activists in Canada, including those raising concerns about democracy and civil rights in Hong Kong, and Beijing's mistreatment of Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Falun Gong practitioners, a new report says. Now, a lot of my work at Epoch Times uh, since 2008 has been investigating operations from the Chinese regime exactly like this. Now, to me, this says United Front Work Department. It also says Chinese Student and Scholar Associations and Overseas Chinese Affairs Office. Now, the United Front Work Department is the main branch of the Chinese Communist Party that works on overt espionage, and it works hand-in-hand -hand with the Overseas Chinese Affairs Office. These are organizations that will go into foreign communities and intimidate democracy activists, intimidate religious believers, intimidate Chinese dissidents, 
who would very likely try to warn the world about what the Chinese regime is doing in China. And one of the main organizations used to influence the universities is the Confucius Institutes. And these are state-funded organizations that the Chinese regime sends abroad to different universities, oftentimes paying the universities to host their programs. And they're Chinese language and culture programs, but not traditional Chinese language and culture programs. They're specifically Chinese language and culture programs meant to promote the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, there's a great documentary on the Confucius Institutes. You want to check it out. It's called In the Name of Confucius. In Canada, actually, this, these have been mostly exposed. A lot of them have been gotten rid of. But there have been some reports that they are still doing this in Canada, but the universities have not been disclosing it. Moving on again in Canada, Global News is reporting that Trudeau says world has questions, particularly for China, on COVID-19 origin. And it's interesting to see now that the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, is taking a stand against the Chinese Communist Party, joining many other countries, including Australia, including many parts of Europe, and including the United States, in questioning the Chinese origin of this virus. Now, on to the WHO. Newsweek is reporting that as China hoarded medical supplies, the CIA believes it tried to stop the WHO from sounding the alarm on the pandemic. And the National Review is reporting that the WHO says it cannot invite Taiwan to annual summit after China says participation would, quote, severely violate the One China principle. Now, for some context on this, many countries, including the United States, have been supporting Taiwan's entry into the WHO. And the, the Taiwan, even though it has played such a big role in helping warn the world about this virus and helping even supply medical equipment to different countries, it is not being allowed into the WHO. And it is believed that that is because of pressure from the Chinese Communist Party. And as I said before, the... The question of whether under the current request from different countries of whether Taiwan will be allowed into the WHO will be a clear sign to the world of whether the WHO is independent or whether it is under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party. And with that said, this is a good lead into the interview we're going to have today with Alex Newman. Now, Alex Newman is an award-winning international journalist, educator, author, and consultant. He serves as a CEO of Liberty Sentinel Media and writes for diverse publications in the United States and abroad. And we're going to be talking specifically about some of his investigations into how the Chinese regime has subverted the United Nations and the WHO. So with that said, let's jump into the interview now. Hey, Alex, real great having you on Crossroads. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much, Josh. And so, Alex, I know you've done a lot of investigations into the United Nations, into organizations like the WHO, like the Human Rights Council, and especially around the Chinese regime's influence in these organizations. Um, I guess to start, I know you just recently did an article for Epoch Times talking about some of the different Chinese agents working in these organizations. So tell us what you found. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, Security and Economic Review Commission just released an updated report in April where they showed kind of the communist Chinese agents in leadership positions within not just the United Nations, but also other international organizations. Um, a decent report. Uh, a lot of names identified that needed to be identified. Uh, they didn't really draw any conclusions in the report, but I did get a statement from their spokesperson uh, noting that uh, policymakers really ought to be paying attention to this. And it's actually even worse than the report lets on, Josh. There, there's a number of very, very senior uh, communist Chinese agents who were not even listed in the report. I'll give you an example the Deputy Director General of UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, uh, you know, second highest ranking official in one of the most important UN agencies. This is the UN agency that's basically positioning itself to become like the global ministry of education or the global school board, if you will. Uh, and the second in command is a member of the Communist Chinese Party, a Communist Chinese agent. And, you know, they didn't talk about this much in the report either, but another huge factor here is that when you have a communist Chinese leader in one of these UN agencies, it's not like having an American leader or a French leader or a Japanese leader. You know, they all take an oath and they say we're international civil servants. We don't, uh, you know, respond to requests from our government. We don't obey any political party in our home country. 
But the Communist Chinese have been very open about the fact that they expect any Chinese national who's working within the international system to maintain full and total loyalty to the Communist Party of China. Uh, they actually arrested the head of Interpol, a communist Chinese agent, uh, until pretty recently, the president of Interpol, he went back to China and they arrested him. And one of the reasons they said they arrested him publicly was because he wasn't obeying the decisions of the party. Uh, you had another senior Chinese official, the head of uh, DESA, the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, who actually went on communist Chinese television, and I talk about this in my article, and bragged about how he continues to represent communist China's interests, even in his senior UN position, to the point where communist China didn't want a Chinese dissident to come to one of these UN meetings, and so he had UN police remove him. And that's kind of what we're dealing with here. I mean, the, the leadership of the UN is now completely compromised by communist Chinese agents. Uh, it's like the elephant in the room, and nobody really wants to talk about it. Hmm. Well, and I know that this isn't just about politics, it's not just about business, it also has to do a lot with human rights. Um, I know a while back you did an article exposing how the Human Rights Council, through Chinese influence, actually exposed the names of individuals, and I think at least one of them was killed uh, in Chinese custody because of this. Can you tell us a story you found on that? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and actually, I interviewed uh, Emma Riley again for this uh, most recent article that should be uh, posted online very soon here. Um, she was working within the human rights apparatus of the United Nations, and she found out early on that um, people within the UN bureaucracy were handing names of Chinese dissidents to the mass murdering regime in Beijing. So these dissidents, they, maybe they were coming to testify in Geneva about human rights abuses. Maybe they already lived outside of China and were coming to testify. And what happens is the UN would actually give these names over to the Communist Party of China. And then the party state would either kidnap those dissidents before they left the country to testify and provide evidence to the UN. Or if the person was already beyond their reach, they would actually kidnap their family. So, you know, you have a, a situation that's completely out of control there. And then, you know, you, you would think any, any reasonable person looking at this would say, oh, my goodness, that's insane. How could that possibly happen? Well, Emma Riley thought the same thing. And so naturally, she assumed it was just a matter of reporting it and, and it would stop. Well, she found out the hard way that that was not the case. Uh, instead, rather than disciplining the people who were handing the names over to communist China, she was disciplined. And uh, this is the story we find over and over and over again within the United Nations when it comes to whistleblowers and when it comes to communist Chinese influence. You don't rock the boat. You don't question these kinds of policies. You just go along to get along. Or you might end up marched out of your office by armed UN police and then smeared and slandered in the media, which is what, uh, what has happened to many of these whistleblowers. And uh, Emma Riley, She's an Irish national who was working in the human rights bureaucracy. Uh, she was actually uh, involved in this incident where the head, the communist Chinese head of DESA, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, had a Chinese dissident from the uh, Uyghur Congress removed from the facility. She saw all this and she tried to intervene. She actually tried to get the Western governments involved. Uh, but, of course, communist China is just so powerful within the UN system now that, you know, it's like hollering into a hurricane. And when it comes to the UN, I mean, it, they're, they're a complicated organization to crack. I mean, uh, from a fair standpoint, we could assume that maybe it's just different countries coming together and they all have their own interests in doing so. Some of the Western countries, of course, they're pushing this whole globalist agenda. The Chinese regime is pushing this whole Chinese nationalist uh, Communist Party agenda. And it seems that the Chinese regime has gained a large amount of influence within the UN, basically because it's prioritizing that to such a degree. Uh, how would you say the interests of the Chinese regime, how do they work within the UN, and how does the UN view that, as far as you've seen? Yeah, I mean, the UN was almost ripe for the pickings, right? And unfortunately, this is a problem that goes all the way back to the very beginning. You know, Stalin was one of the key people involved in setting up the United Nations. And not a lot of people like to talk about that. You really don't read about that much in Western history books. Uh, and then on our side, we, we sent a guy, uh, very, very influential. He used to be the, uh, the head of the Carnegie Foundation. Then later he went on to go work at the State Department. And he was a key figure in the establishment of the UN. He actually served as the first act, acting secretary general. And he was the chairman of the conference that created the UN Charter. And later we found out he was actually working for Stalin. And so we even threw him into prison for that. So right from the very beginning, you had communist subversives uh, right at the heart of UN power. And unfortunately, that never really went away. Now, it's true the U.S., just by virtue of the fact that it, it has been 
by far the largest uh, monetary contributor, has been able to kind of keep some of that in check, and there's still a veto power. But the Communist Chinese have recognized uh, the UN is basically at the center of global governance, as they themselves put it. And so they have now made a concerted, uh, massive effort to infiltrate and take over these agencies. Uh, they actually set up what they call a school of global governance. That's, that's the name of the school at the Beijing Foreign Service University, which is you know the elite school to train up diplomats and spies and things like this. Uh, and they are now training up thousands of agents that they are shoving into these international organizations, not just the UN, but also the IMF and the World Bank and, uh, you know, even inter-American bodies, right, that you would think it wouldn't really have much to do with China. Even there, you see communist Chinese agents and this uh, USCC report documents some of that. You know, one of the goals of communist China is just to seize control of this architecture. They see it as very important, and depending on what UN agency, each one has a different function. But each one allows China to project its power way beyond its own borders. So UNESCO is a good example. Right? They now have a, a major role to play in education systems around the world. In fact, they help national governments build education systems. They play a role in textbooks. I mean, it's an incredibly powerful organization. Trump actually withdrew us from that, which was, uh, in my opinion, a very positive development, but still UNESCO is incredibly powerful. Uh, they have their agents sitting on top of four out of 15 UN specialized agencies, and each one of these gives Communist China enormous influence. So for example, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the UN FAO, is now run by a Communist Chinese agent. This puts billions of taxpayer dollars at their disposal to hand out to their cronies, to communist governments, whoever they see fit. Uh, they give awards to uh, you know, Venezuela and Cuba for being so great. Um, and it allows them to influence agricultural policy around the world. And it allows them to advance this one belt, one road project, You know, their new Silk Road project. They have UN agencies all over the place boosting this, promoting this, using Western money to sell this. Uh, you also have UN leaders of, uh, excuse me, Chinese leaders in UN organizations that are promoting communist Chinese companies. Like the the head of UNIDO, the UN Industrial Development Organization, is also a member of the Communist Chinese Party. He's a big time promoter of the One Belt One Road project. He's also a big time promoter of Huawei, right? The the communist Chinese military company that's trying to wiggle its way into the communication systems of the world. Uh, all across the UN, you have these types of things, and this really magnifies their ability to project power abroad. And, and it's gotten so blatant now where they'll put out press releases praising communist China. When we saw this recently with the World Health Organization, uh, Tedros, right, elected with support, uh, powerful support from communist China, basically just parroting communist Chinese propaganda. Oh, the communist Chinese did so good on coronavirus. Oh, they're doing so good on uh, you know improving the health of their citizens. Now, Alex, I guess just last question: If if you want, if you people take home anything from this, what do you hope they take home? What do you, what do you hope to get across with this? Well, you know, I I think everybody, uh, policymakers in particular, needs to realize that we are facing a threat of enormous proportions, and it's not a you know a traditional military threat in the sense of you know hey they're going to march an army over the border that might happen someday, but this is kind of an irregular threat in the sense that they are taking over these institutions that already play a major role in the lives of people all over the world. They're hijacking them, they're weaponizing them uh, to subvert individual freedom, to subvert our cultures, to support, uh, to, to subvert our families, uh, and that is extremely troubling. Um, and you know, now that this is kind of becoming more well known, there there is this agenda, and, and I wrote about this uh, in the Epic Times back in September, uh, an article on China's subversion of the United Nations, how there was an orchestrated effort to try to blame this problem on President Trump. Uh, I think there needs to be you know a very very clear uh, refutation of that idea. This was going on long before President Trump came into power, and actually President Trump has tried more than anybody in my lifetime, as far as U.S. government leaders are concerned to put a stop to this. But I think the big takeaway, Josh, is we are dealing with an unprecedented, enormous threat uh, that has the capacity, has the potential to further erode our individual liberty, to further erode our ability to govern ourselves here in the United States and in other um, you know, independent, self-governing countries, uh, and, and that this threat must be dealt with. And how exactly it's dealt with, I mean, everybody's got an opinion on that. You know, some of the people I interviewed thought we needed new checks and balances. Um, I think Trump has been pursuing a very, very wise strategy. I know he's getting a lot of criticism for this, 
but defunding and withdrawing from these UN agencies. But regardless of what approach we take for dealing with this, uh, I think at this point it is beyond clear that we must address it, we must deal with it. We can't just put our head in the sand and hope this is going to go away. It's not going to go away, and if you put your head in the sand, you're going to end up uh, having your butt bitten by uh, totalitarians. And so we've got to take this seriously, Josh, and I think that's the big takeaway. Alex, a real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. Always a pleasure. We are continuing these broadcasts Monday through Friday, five days a week. And if you want to join the premiere, you can join on YouTube at 10.30 p.m. And also, folks, some of you have asked what you can do about the situation with the Chinese regime and some of the issues we talk about here. The Epoch Times and NTD have launched a global petition calling for the investigation, condemnation, and rejection of the Chinese Communist Party. We have a new link for that petition. It's rejectccp.com. Again, rejectccp.com. Now, of course, you're encouraged to go there and sign it. If you want to, look, if you want to go the extra mile, tell five friends or family about the petition. That said, folks, thanks again. Stay healthy. Take care of yourselves. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>